Welcome to the Chemical Review Thematic Talk Series. Um, this series highlights thematic issues published in 2021, and our goal is to bring the experts to the community. Today's topic is quantum materials, and we have a guest editor to provide an introduction and four of our authors to talk about their published reviews on exciting, cutting edge research in this field. The speakers are going to provide their perspectives as experts in the field with a particular focus on the remaining challenges and future directions. And we'll have a few minutes for questions at the end of each talk. Please put your questions into the Q&A um, if you have them at the end of the talk. So to start us out, we have one of our guest edit, edit, uh, editors, uh, Natalie Belion um, from Princeton University, and she is going to give opening remarks and an introduction, and then we'll have our four talks. So Natalie, take it away. All right, thanks, uh, Sharon. Let me just share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. Uh, right, well, thank you for the invitation to, um, you know, come introduce all of these great speakers. Uh, so what uh, we're focused on today is this, uh, this very nice collection of review papers uh, that, it, that came out this year on quantum materials. Um, so quantum materials is an extremely broad topic uh, that has attracted a, a lot of interest from many different uh, aspects of the community. Um, so I just thought I would try to group some of the review papers in this um, in this issue in a few categories, and hopefully I haven't done anything that is objectionable for some of our authors. Uh, so I would say that uh, you know the bulk or many of the papers in this uh, in this collection of reviews is is really on strongly correlated materials. So the idea is that you know you have some material system where you really need to think about electron-electron interactions or some other kind of strong interactions uh, inside the material to, to describe even bulk um, properties of those materials. And this is a, a really you know, incredible field with a lot of beautiful physics and also beautiful chemistry. Um, so we have, uh, you know, these uh, different topics, uh, topological quantum materials from the viewpoint of chemistry, magnetic skirmion materials, uh, the chemistry of quantum spin liquids. Um, uh, one of the talks today by uh, Bob Kava, who also was one of the guest editors, uh, is on hexagonal perovskites as quantum materials, and then uh, chemistry and superconductors, um, again, another guest editor, uh, Wei Wei Xi. Um, another topic that, that's covered by this issue uh, is just uh, generally trying to understand these material systems. So there's a review paper on uh, using spectroscopy techniques to be able to understand quantum materials. Um, and then a couple of, of theory papers on orbital effects in, in solids, uh, and then you know using these sort of theoretical methods to understand doping of, of quantum materials. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, there's uh, some focus in this issue on trying to find new systems, both for um, sort of these strongly correlated materials and, and uh, you know, quantum materials, but also in materials for things like quantum information processing and trying to understand how you can use these materials um, to develop, you know, new quantum technologies. Uh, so under this header, um, although Pre's review honestly is, is quite broad and I highly, highly recommend it as a, as a great primer to many aspects of the field, um, is on quantum information and algorithms for correlated uh, quantum matter. Uh, and that's the subject of one of the speakers today, Pre-Neha Narang, um, advances in materials and applications of inorganic electrodes. Uh, and then finally, a, another speaker today, uh, Sherry Kagan, uh, wrote a review paper on colloidal quantum dots as platforms for quantum information science. Um, so with that, I will uh, get out of the way and just uh, introduce the first speaker. And Sharon, are we changing the schedule or not? I think Bob has called in now. Yes, we will change the schedule. Um, Bob would love to be moved to the end. Um, but I think, Bob, if you could mute yourself, it's a bit, good. there's some, some interference here. Um, that would be great. Thank you, Bob. Okay, so I think we're going to move because of some technical difficulties. We're changing the order, but uh, we're very happy then to start with uh, Sherry Kagan, who is going to talk about her review on colloidal quantum dots as platforms for quantum information science. Hmm. 
Very good. Well, thank you very much. I want to start by uh, thanking Sharon as well as all of the editors for the opportunity to get to uh, participate um, uh, is, uh, in this uh, special issue, as well as to uh, share the topic of colloidal quantum dots um, and the context and looking them as them as uh, one of the new systems as a, uh, and thinking about a platform for quantum information science. And so I just want to introduce my co-authors. Um, so we had a, a lot of um, hard work, but fun in writing this, uh, uh, the, this manuscript. So my colleagues, uh, Lee Bassett, uh, Chris Murray, and uh, Sarah Thompson, all from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. So I'll just start by maybe giving you a bit of an introduction uh, to, uh, let's hide this for a second, to um, uh, colloidal quantum dots. And so I'll start by just showing you a high level picture about what we think about and sort of a, a way to uh, introduce this uh, article as well as a presentation. So today I'm gonna to introduce you to quantum dots, which you can see a depiction of one here. I'll talk to you about how we can use these as a, or think about using them as a platform for photon and spin qubits. And the opportunity that if you look at this uh, schematic of a particle, often these are on the order of two to 20 nanometers. You can certainly make them bigger to, to uh, tens of nanometers, um, but that you can think about packaging all of the function uh, of a photon or a spin qubit into the size of one of these small particles. Um, and so that gives you a real opportunity uh, for many of the examples I'll tell you today, this particle may be five nanometers in diameter, just to give you a sense. And then we think about the opportunity that I'll show you today through synthesis uh, and design to think about how do we tailor the size, shape, and composition of these, of these uh, particles as a way to sculpt sort of the energy landscape and then to use it as a way to isolate and control the quantum mechanical properties of charge, uh, spin, and light. So I'll uh, introduce that. And that gives us an opportunity to create uh, qubits. And then finally, I'll finish by describing now flipping the side of them being from quantum dots to talking about them as colloidal materials and the opportunities to use um, these materials and use, for example, assembly techniques so that you can determine, deterministically position single quantum dots and also as shown here in this schematic uh, to create ordered quantum dot arrays. So just to start as an introduction, many of you have, may have seen this before. Uh, but a uh, lots of the examples I'll be showing you today involve an inorganic uh, core or crystalline uh, particle. It's a, basically a fragment of the bulk single crystal. Um, and then often it'll have either an, another inorganic shell. And then finally, if it does in any, any of the cases, it'll often also have a ligand shell on the surface. And this ligand shell helps to allow us to disperse these uh, particles uh, in solution. And so we talk about them both as quantum dots because uh, they have, they're typically the size of these particles, as I mentioned before, is very small. And it's typically small in comparison to the Bohr exciton radius. And so as a result, it feels the effects of quantum confinement. And so you can think about your sort of classic particle in a box uh, approach and think about the electronic states that I've tried to uh, draw here in an energy versus distance uh, diagram, where you can see that instead of having a band gap that's characteristic of the bulk semiconductor, now by shrinking the size of the particles, you can control the effective band gap of the quantum dot. And so this is a very classic uh, equation from, uh, from developed by uh, Lee Bruce many years ago that describes how you can tune the, the, the band gap of the quantum dot as a function of its size. And on the right hand side, I pick some examples from our colleagues in the community where you can see in the upper right fluorescence images all of the same 2,6 semiconductor, but simply by controlling its size, you can control its band gap and therefore the color of its emission across the visible portion of the spectrum. And not only can you do that with uh, uh, quantum dots that uh, have compositions that span the visible portion of the spectrum, but if you look in this compilation by the Reese group from Grenoble, you can see that by controlling the composition as well as size and also, you can control shape, but you can tailor the uh, color of these materials um, from the UV through the visible and into the infrared. And these are, of course, broadly looked at in conventional uh, optoelectronic devices. And today, I want to introduce you to thinking about them as platforms for quantum information science. 
So just to give you a handle um, and a sort of very quick perspective on the community, there's been a lot of advances in, in synthesis to make these colloidal quantum dots. And so you can uh, grow these in a flask and convent, uh, very simple glassware. And that you, uh, as you put in uh, and sort of inject these precursors, one of the common methods used in, in their synthesis, you kind of get this burst of nucleation and then you can control their growth. And along that way of the controlling the growth of those materials, you can get different size uh, particles along that, along that system. And so this is an example, uh, one that we worked on many years ago, uh, where these are cadmium selenide quantum dots. And you can see their crystalline cores. And the white space in this assembly is actually taken up by the organic ligands. And over time, the community has really made a number of, of advances in being able to broaden the range of compositions that you can make quantum dots. And then you can also get much more sophisticated in controlling the complexity of their, uh, of their structure internally. So for example, you can take these particles and use them as seeds and overgrow another semiconductor on top to make core and shell structures, much like heterostructures you know from bulk semiconductors. And you can also use approaches first in introduced by the Alibasados group uh, to use cation exchange where you can replace one of the cation, for example, with a different cation that can also be used to grow core shell structures. You can make sort of these, uh, what we call segmented uh, structures uh, with a, sorry, side by side. And you can also use it by controlling the concentration and the other uh, ligands in the solution to actually use them to dope these quantum dots. So this just gives you a sense of the opportunity of the landscape that could be achieved in designing these materials. So with that, I thought I would just introduce you a little to a little bit about there have been 30 years of, of, of spectroscopy, as well as uh, both uh, 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 theory and computation to actually understand the quantum mechanics of colloidal quantum dots. So I'll just briefly say that if you look at these uh, quantum dots and you think about them as a particle in, in a box, for many of the 2, 6, 3, 5, 4, 6, 1, 3, 6, lots of different compositions of, of semiconductors that have been made, um, often when there was a core and just the ligand shell, we appreciated them for their bright exotonic luminescence, but bright was still something often at room temperature of about 10% where you could, you know, uh, uh, both excite and get luminescence from the quantum dot states. Um, but of course, the surface presented uh, dangling bonds that could create trap states that would limit the quantum yield. And so I'll show you examples, but also by overgrowing a shell, like you would in, a, in quantum dot heterostructures, you can get near unity uh, quantum dots. Um, and so, in fact, some of these compositions are commercialized if you buy a quantum dot television where the uh, luminescence, in fact, and the yield is extremely high. So we know we can really make very bright and stable uh, optical emitters from colloidal quantum dots. And over time, the ability to control the size distribution of these materials means that you can see spectroscopically that at room temperature, the line width of an ensemble is not that much different in the best quantum dot samples as you get from uh, single particles. This is an early over here uh, luminescence spectra at low temperature where you can see the vibronic progression characteristic of individual dots and the very sort of um, hundreds of microelectron volt based line widths that can be achieved. Uh, then there were some even nicer, higher resolution spectroscopy done where you can see this uh, same progression as well as some of the acoustic phonons. And key to thinking about these as platforms and the excitons were measurements of correlation or what's known as anti-bunching, uh, where you can see that at zero time scale, you don't have the coincidence of two photons. And this is a characteristic signature that is looked for in characterizing single photon emitters. So this, these colloidal quantum dots really can be used as single photon emitters. Interestingly enough, and in the detail of the uh, excitonic states, in many of the conventional um, uh, 2, 6, 3, 5, 4, 6 semiconductors, and I won't go through this in too detail, but the lowest excitonic state is actually optically dark. And so as a result, as we think about their application in quantum information science, it often means that their radiative lifetimes are, are still long in compared to their optical coherence times, which are typically much shorter on the, under, on the order of 100 picoseconds. 
And so this fine structure is something that uh, is important for us to understand and also one that can be manipulated through the design of the quantum dots. And so people have shown that you can start to tailor this by and even flip the order of some of these states by controlling their size and shape. And I'll just briefly say these, because these of course have, uh, are examples of uh, metal halide perovskite quantum dots that are sort of newer uh, to the community. And so I just thought I would show these examples here. And these same kinds of phenomena of, um, of uh, single photon emission can also be seen. And very, these are very bright emitters. Uh, they're very stable in, in time where they, uh, they don't fluctuate. They're very, very nice and reliable. And interestingly enough, because of the difference in the ordering of their states, their optical st lowest energy state is bright. And so their uh, coherence times are comparable, which merely uh, to their radiative lifetimes, which this is a measure of the purity that uh, uh, one might be able to achieve in single photon emission, looking at colloidal quantum dots. So without getting too long, I just want to introduce the uh, sort of one last uh, opportunity which is to think about colloidal quantum dots as hosts for spin qubits. So for example, you can tailor, because you can tailor the band gap, you can really control and make this very wide. You can use all of this energy landscape as uh, an opportunity for you to design and introduce defect states with or doping states within the core of the quantum dot, which is shown here. Um, and then uh, be able, basically be able to use this energy landscape as a as a way to, um, uh, uh, to use and design uh, these defects or dopants. So I'll just give two examples. This is an ex one example is the um, nitrogen vacancy center in diamond, where if you think about diamond, it has a very big band gap, but by having the nitrogen vacancy complex, you get this manifold, these manifolds of states that are being looked at for spin qubits. Um, and for example, these also can be made not typically by the same colloidal methods I described, but they can be made in particulate form and dispersed as colloids. And then this is just some of the examples uh, and some recent work uh, that Lee's group and my group have been doing collaboratively through our student Henry in looking at the spectroscopy and, and single photon characteristics of these, of these nanodiamonds. You can also, this is some nice work in the community that's been going on in looking at introducing transition metals, again, using this landscape and then uh, getting a, uh, you have exchange coupling that occurs between this transition metal and the quantum dot, and you get this sort of multiplet of spin uh, states, as you can see here. So this is really just a start to think about the opportunities that you can use quantum dots as hosts for both photon and spin qubits. And so sort of one last requirement I just wanna show you sort of quickly is the opportunity, as I mentioned at the beginning, to take advantage now, not of their quantum properties, but more of their uh, sort of colloidal properties and what's important for their applications in quantum technologies. So often we wanna be able to position or integrate uh, these, um, these uh, qubits in, for example, photonic cavities or uh, to put them on surfaces. And I'll just briefly say that there are techniques that come from the community working on nanoscale uh, materials that are possible. So for example, AFM tips can be used to position or print using dip pen lithography to put, uh, to integrate these uh, quantum dots into cavities. You can use template directed assembly where sort of capillary forces can be, uh, and templates will guide the assembly and then also can be used to control and enhance emission in the geometry of different cavities. And finally, there are some examples too where optical printing can be used to local, uh, to create fields that provide radiation pressure that position particles uh, on surfaces at the length scales that we're talking about here. And finally, for some technologies, we want arrays of particles. And so I just thought I would show you some examples of the sophistication that can be achieved. You can certainly make uh, large arrays of, of one type of, of quantum dot or, or nanocrystal. You can do it with two, you can do it with three. So this is an example where there's a ternary assembly combining three different um, composition and size different uh, particles. And then you can also, for example, do that with different shape uh, particles. And this is, for example, rods, where you can even control whether they lay down or they stand up. And so there's lots of opportunity to exploit the, the sort of assembly side uh, that's been developed by the community working on nanoscale materials. So with that, I'll finish and just give you the conclusion that I hope I've shared with you today that 
quantum dots serve as an opportunity where we can look to encode uh, uh, excitons that get sort of uh, delocalized over the volume of the quantum dot or in to introduce these uh, defects or dopants that will allow us to create charge and spin states. And ultimately we can look at, depending upon the application, different, uh, these different examples may be uh, appropriate opportunities. For example, like the single photon emitters uh, that I showed you today. Um, and opportunities, for example, to put in defects uh, to look at uh, spin qubits and, ult and then finally to integrate them into architectures for devices. So with that, I'll stop and uh, um, I guess I'm happy to answer any questions. And please put any questions you might have in the Q&A um, that you should be able to uh, see a, a link to that, a, a, that's a, something you can click on to uh, put your questions in the Q&A. Well, if there are no questions in the Q&A, I might abuse my position and just ask uh, my own question. Um, so, Jerry, I thought this, this uh, idea of trying to find defect centers and quantum dots was pretty interesting. Do you have any guesses about where you would start to look for, you know, like what kinds of things you would put in quantum dots to try to look for, say, spin transitions and um, spin optical interfaces? So I do. There are lots of examples that we know from bulk analogs, often ones where we think about that, you know, uh, that have broadly been understood as color centers, for example. And so there are lots of transition metals, rare earth ions that you could imagine putting in some of the um, materials have been well ex uh, explored by the techniques that I showed you today. And I also want to just also give the example, right, that you can take even some of the bulk analogs of things like diamond or silicon and make them into small particle form. And so I'll just say, you know, there's an opportunity even in small particles where by having it in that little package also offers you an opportunity not to have background and, you know, things coming, you know, where you really can study um, uh, and so uh, the plat you know the platforms of those centers themselves. So I think, but to your 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 question is that I think we actually learn a lot from the old literature um, on looking at color centers. Okay, so there are two questions in the Q and A. Um, the first is thanks for the nice presentation. Could you please share how the point defects in these systems are characterized? And uh, I will probably say this name wrong, but that's from Shreyash Hadki. Sure. So often, actually, that you, you ad address a problem that has actually always been very difficult in the community, which is actually how you characterize those defects or, or dopants. On that slide on synthesis, I showed an example of uh, aberration corrected, but it's angular dark field stem uh, that people have used. For some systems, you can also use EPR, um, but those are some of the examples of characterization techniques. Um, that one would use to characterize, to know that the defect is, is there. And then of course we can, from a sort of spectroscopy standpoint, you can of course use single particle spectroscopy measurements. Okay, and then I think we probably just have time for one more question. I don't remember how late we started. Um, from Shane Lawrence, uh, can the short radiation lifetime be an advantage in improving fluorescent quality? Yeah, so the short lifetime is, so this is where it depends on your application. The short lifetime is also, um, it's very good for making very bright emitters. So if, sort of this uh, tension between making very bright uh, single photon emitters, which you can certainly do, uh, with the flip side being that if you, so for some applications that might be great. If you wanted to do, um, uh, if you needed a technology that required longer lifetimes, for example, in a memory, then you might think, you, you'll have to have a trade-off with something that often has a longer lifetime but metal stable state, but often then is not as bright. So the opportunity is to also think about, you know, are there ways that we can engineer to, uh, for the different applications to achieve both, but they're certainly very good, very nice bright emitters. Okay, there are a few more questions in the Q&A, but maybe you can answer yeah, I'll by typing. I'll, I'll, I'll type them in, thanks. Yeah, thanks for all the questions. It's wonderful to have the audience participation and I'm sure Sherry will be happy to type her responses to the ones that we didn't get to. But uh, now we want to move on to our next talk, which is by Wei Wei Ji, who's going to tell us about chemistry in superconductors.
Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Wei Wei. Okay, so. Uh, it's my great pleasure to give the talk in the chemistry review hosted the special uh, issues on the quantum materials. And today I'm going to talk about chemistry in superconductors. I think most of the time when we talk about superconductors, people always think about that's what the condensed matter people are doing. So, so that's why today I'm, I'm going to talk about how our chemistry people can do uh, to the superconductivities. Okay, so first of all, I want to uh, thank my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Bing Lui, Professor Bing Lui at the University of UT Dallas, uh, the Department of Physics. He helped us a lot with the manuscript and uh, like especially about the physics part. And then the other co-author is Xin Gui. He, uh, he used to be my stu graduate student. Um, now he graduated and uh, studied his postdoc at Professor Kava's group at Princeton University. So, okay, now let's get started. Okay, I have a question for you guys. I think oh, I saw a lot of audience there. So the first question is when we're talking about the superconductors, what's the first things, first imaging coming to your mind? Okay, for me is every time when we're talking about superconductor, we can imagine there are chemistry professors doing the demonstration to a lot of group, uh, to a lot of kids. And then what they're doing is they put a ferromagnet, right? The ferromagnet into the they put a ferromagnet above the superconducting superconductors, superconducting materials, and then they're slowly cooling down the superconductors, and then the ferromagnets will be lifted up, and the kids will say, wow, that's so cool. Okay, so actually this phenomenon is a very unique property of the superconductor. That's the Mansler effect. So that means if we're cooling the superconductor below its critical temperature, it will have the exposure of the magnetic field, okay? So if we're making the superconducting material into the materials for the magnetic levitation trend, so there will be no contact between the rear and the trend, okay? So another very unique properties of the superconductors is the zero electrical resistivity. And similarly, if we're cooling down the superconductor below its critical temperature, the resistivity will drop to zero. So if we can make the uh, superconducting material to transfer the electricity, we will get zero power loss. So it's a very clean energy material. Okay, so now let's look into the material of the superconductor, how the electrons moves in the superconductors. For the normal metal, the electrons in the normal metal, they move at a different rate. So the electrons, electrons may collision, may have collision and they have scattering and this scattering will generate the resistance. Okay, but in superconductor, it's a different story and electrons moves at the same rate. So there's no scattering and no resistance. And how it happened is because the electron, electron actually they form a pair but they are not formed the pair directly. In the conventional superconductor, electrons, electrons, they form the pair through the lattice vibration. And we also have a name for it called phonon. So this electron, electron uh, mediated by the phonon interactions, we call it a Cooper pair. Okay, so electrons, electrons are very tiny, right? And this Cooper pair could be as long as hundreds of angstroms. So that's very large. So can you imagine? So these two electrons, they have a big distance between each other, but they still can communicate with each other and make them move at the same rate. So you can imagine you and your best, best friend put you two in the big football stadium, okay? Two corners of the big, big football stadium. Can you, you don't have cell phone to communicate with each other. Can you move at the same rate without telling each other? No, right? It's very hard. Maybe you can. So if you can, then your, you and your friend will be a good system to study this quantum entanglement. But in superconductor, these cooperate pairs are ideal system to study the quantum entanglements for the quantum material for the quantum systems. So superconductor is a very promising material for the future technology. But but it doesn't mean superconductor is a young material, okay? We, the first superconductivity was absorbed in mercury in 1911, so 110 years ago. And after that, many superconductors was discovered, but mainly in the, um, the, the elements and in their alloys. 
And after almost half century, the first superconductivity theory was proposed. That's the very famous BCS theory in 1957. Okay, this the BCA theory explained the conventional superconductor very well. That's what I talked about this electron, phonon, electron, these interactions. And however, after another uh, three decades, okay, three decades, the first high TC superconductor, cuprates, was discovered. And until now, the highest TC uh, superconductor is at ambient pressure, is still in the cuprates. And after another 20 years okay another 20 years the second high tc superconducting family was founded founded in the iron arsenic so see it's almost 100 years right so so based on what we like the history the superconducting history you can see superconductor till now superconductor cannot be predicted and we can see theory is a little bit behind the experiment. So we need to communicate with theory more and to figure out what's really going on in the superconductors. And the most important thing is let's make more new superconductors or like the high TC superconductor or conventional superconductor. And then we can study. So we need to have a big database to study the superconductivities. Okay. so. So besides about this, um, we, we call it a high TC superconductor, heavy fermion superconductor, and there are a lot of interesting things and also going on in the superconducting field. For example, high pressure superconductor, right? Recently, people got very excited. They, they, uh, there was a report said they find out the superconductor, room temperature superconductor at extremely high pressure. Well, even it's very high pressure, but people got very excited because they see the superconductivity at room temperature. So here, there is a very well uh, like proved superconductor that's in the sulfurate hydrate, sulfur hydrate. So if we press the sulfur hydrate into a very high pressure, like 155 GPA, we can see the superconductivity around the 200 Kelvin. Okay. And then um, recently, like around three years ago, and the, the, the group, uh, Professor Pablo's group at MIT, they find out if you just twisted the graphing with a very tiny small angle, and you can get the superconductivity and they absorbed the superconductivity at 1.7 Kelvin. Okay, so the temperature at this one, temperature is, yeah, is important, but it's not that important because they make the, they absorb the superconductivity in the two bilayered graphing, right? That's amazing. And also, I want to give you another example is actually there are a lot of devices we can make it into the superconductors. For example, here, I just show you one example. There are many, many examples. Okay. So what people did is they can make the molybdenum suffer into the transit. And then they put the ionic liquid into it and make it a gate. So this gate induced superconductivity can be absorbed in, for example, here, what I showed is the molybdenum sulfur crystals. Okay. And I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the reference is disappeared. Okay. So the TC can go to as high as 9.0 Kelvin. Okay. So, so now for chemistry. So we talk about a lot of background and now for chemistry. I think a lot of us as a chemist, our intrinsic interest is we try to make something new, right? Organic chemistry and organic chemistry, we all try to make some new materials and which is never reported in the database. But how can we do it? Just like what we said, supercon superconductivity cannot be predicted. And how can we make the new superconductors? Okay, so uh, for the chemistry, when we make the new quantum material, like not only just the superconductors, uh, including topologic materials, magnetic materials, um, we usually studied from their properties, right? The targeted property, for example, superconductivity. And then the all the things I explained, like the Cooper pairs, like the electron phonon couplings, all the stuff. They are all the physics people that proposed to understand this phenomenon. So they put everything into the K space, okay, not the real space, not the real space. And then they try to interpret where is the Fermi surface, where is the Fermi level. Okay, but chemistry, when we go to the lab, what we faced is chemical elements, right? So we try to translate the concept of the physics, like the superconductivity, into a chemistry requirement. So this chemistry requirement, what we usually do is the electron counting rules, yeah, counting the electrons, chemical structures, 
and chemical bondings, right? So this really, the, 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 the chemical terms in the real space that will help us to design the way to make the new materials. And after that, we will go to the inorganic synthesis to make the new superconducting material. And then we love, okay, even I did a lot of experiments, but my, but we love working with the theorists because they help us to modify our um, the requirement, chemical requirements, and also help us to understand these materials very well. Okay, so for the superconductor, we do the similar things. Uh, we study the reported superconductor, and then we try to see if there are any interesting going on with the structures and the electron countings, and we try to make it and use both theory and the experiment to understand the new superconductors, and then try to make more and more new superconductors. So let's look at the two high TC superconductors. One is cuprase, one is iron arsenic superconductor. Okay, um, I think a lot of audience are, don't have the, uh, a lot of physical background, uh, but even though you just look at as a chemistry, you look at these two structures, what did you see from these two structures? I think one thing we can easily find out is um, they are layered compounds, okay? So they're always layered compounds. That's very interesting. And then the second one is, so when we're talking about the cuprase iron arsenates, so there is, I, I'm pretty sure like, a, so if we look at the reference, a lot of people try to see uh, if cuprase works, how about nickel oxides, nickelates, how about like uh, cobalt oxides, iron oxides, it turns out, okay, it turns out most of the time it's not working. So copper oxygen, it's like a favorite pairs for the super, high TC superconductor, they just like each other, okay? And iron arsenic is the same. If you change the iron to other elements, like the, um, for example, like the cobalt, like the manganese, it's not superconductor. Okay, so what we can see is as a chemist, our intuition told us this atomic, specific atomic interaction is very important. And we call it critical charge transfer pairs. Okay, so like the copper oxygen and iron arsenic. So if we want to find new superconductor, especially a new high TC superconductor, what can we do? So our strategy is very simple, is let's find a new critical charge transfer pairs, which is similar to the iron arsenic or copper oxygen. And uh, we're starting from the atomic size and electron activities. For example, if we try to find something to replace the iron arsenic, and then iron selenium could be a good choice. Well, Unfortunately, this kind of idea already been come up, uh, thought uh, by the Professor Kava at Princeton University and a professor. So, and at that time his students, but now he's the very famous professor Tyrell McQueen at John Hopkins. So they did a lot of work on iron selenium. So it's too late. So let's move to other elements. Can we find out other elements? Maybe we can come up with like iridium, okay, with germanium and luthenium with antimony, platinum with arsenic and so on. Okay, so this is our strategy to make the new superconductor is instead of finding, so, and then put this like the uh, critical charge transfer pairs into the layered structure compounds and to see if we can find a new superconductors. Okay, so, and a lot of students and a lot of other, my friends, my colleagues always ask me one question is, wait, wait, do you have any opinions on how to find the high TC superconductors at ambulant pressure? Okay, so here what I wrote as personal opinions on finding high TC superconductors at ambient pressure, okay? So it, it's just my personal opinion, okay? So I, I, I call it try to bring tropical cyclones into dessert, okay? So this tropic cyclones I inter interpreted as the electron-electron direct interaction. So the electron-electron interaction in the conventional superconductor, they are intermediate by the phonon interactions, a phonon, uh, by the phonon interactions in general is too weak. Okay, so it's too weak that couldn't make the TC very high. If we wanted the TC very high, it's better for us to make a very di direct interactions, the electron-electron interactions. Okay, so, but what's the problem is, a lot of time we are scared of the cyclones, we are scared of the hurricane because it will just damage our house and everything, right? So because the same thing for the electron-electron direct interaction, the first like direct result of this direct interaction is they make the magnetic interaction. They did not go to the superconductivity direction, they go to the magnetism. So what we need to do is we try to control it. 
control these electron-electron interactions and then try to make it a ramp production instead of a huge damage, okay? That's the superconductivity. So that's why as a chemist, I really, really appreciate the chemical bonding, this concept, because what I was trying to do, we are trying to do is try to see if we can tune the orbital overlapping in the certain directions and the certain ways, and to avoid electron, electron make the magnetic interaction. Instead, they try to make the superconductivity interaction. Okay, so A this is minutes, like, wait, wait. okay, okay. So then the the the, the sorry, I, I w w like one minute. So so in the end, I would say like uh, if we want to find a high TC superconductor, maybe in the end we still need to go to the three D elements, try to look out, find the co cobalt, nickel, chromium, manganese, the critical charge transfer pairs. Okay, so and okay, so this is like very quickly. I will say how do we make it is. We try to synthesize it and then use the X-ray to determine the structure and measure their superconductivity property and doing the calculation. This is how we do our research. And in the end, I would say, I still don't know how to make the new superconductor. We are just using our experiments to try to make more and more new superconductors and uh, uh, to discuss with more theorists and see and our colleagues and find out if we can make more new superconductor and find out the mysteries of the superconductivity. And in the end, I would like to thank my colleagues, my students, and my collaborators. They, thanks for their support. And especially thanks to the Professor David Ginger, Professor Sh uh, Sharon, and the Chemical Review Office, and all the audience. And do you have any question? Okay. All right. Thanks, Weiwei. Thank you. So again, if you have questions, please just uh, click the button that says Q&A at the bottom of your screen and we'd be happy to, uh, uh, Natalie would, will read them aloud. So far, there's just one question that says, thank you, very inspiring presentation. Um, Maybe I can just ask one really quick question, which is, do, so do you think there are any lessons that we can learn from this kind of room temperature, uh, high pressure superconductivity result? Or is, is your feeling that, that's, uh, that it's hard to extrapolate down to ambient conditions from those kinds of materials? Um, I, I think um, for the high pressure one, I think that's very cool. But but I think what we 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 really appreciate this result. But I was thinking is maybe we can try to use the high pressure synthesize to stabilize this phase. Uh, then then maybe like uh, could increase the TC. Maybe not that dramatically because at the room uh, ambient pressure it will come back again. But at least uh, try to improve a little bit. Yeah, I really appreciate that this high pressure technique. It really give us a lot of hope. <laughs> uh, there's a question from Rebecca Katz. How can strong electron coupling avoid becoming magnetic? Okay, so this is, this is a very good question. And uh, I think what I explained uh, here is our strategy is try to, because we think about the specific interactions. So like the electron electrons, they coupled overlapped a certain way. So if they overlap in a specific way, they may avoid to make the magnetic interactions. So this is our strategy. So yeah, we, we, we are working on it. We are working on it. So that's why we think the chemical bonding is very important to understand this one. Uh, okay, well, maybe in the interest of time, we should move on to the next talk, but there's a couple more questions that you can answer. Uh, yes, I can room. type it. Yes, okay. Yeah, thank you. All right, wonderful, yes. And I'm sure that Weiwei will, will uh, type her answers to the questions. I see at least three more um, waiting. So that's that's wonderful. Um, you can keep them coming. Um, but now we are in for a treat because we're going to hear from Prinia Narong, who's going to tell us about quantum information and algorithms for correlated quantum matter. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me here. Hopefully you see my slides in full screen mode. I'm really 
delighted to share the work that we've written about in this uh, ChemRev. Actually, I uh, finally got my physical copy, and I have been very excited to, to uh, read something that is a, a, an actual book. So when we started writing this review, um, you know, we realized that even, even amongst the, the authors, we had a lot of interdisciplinary uh, representation. So Dr. Kadehead Parson, who has a degree in theoretical chemistry and mathematics, Dr. Johannes Flick, who has a degree in theoretical physics and algorithms, Chris Chicorino, who's a graduate student in my group in chemical physics, and of course, uh, my own background. What we aim to do in this review is to, to have a common language that allows people from across fields, across fields of electronic structure theory, quantum information, quantum electrodynamics, algorithm design, and open quantum systems to come together, particularly towards the problem of, of thinking about not exponential complexity for correlated quantum matter. We think that this has uh, implications. We anticipate that correlated quantum matter that is discovered and developed in the next years will have uh, impact in the areas of quantum information processing, which includes computing, sensing, metrology, as well as the, the fact that these new algorithms can start to use quantum devices will allow us to think about many body quantum systems in a different way. So as we started writing it, it quickly went from a succinct review to, um, I think, nearly uh, about a, a thousand uh, references. And I'll give you some highlights from, from this uh, review. And I know I was told, um, yes, you're a theorist, but, but avoid having equations. So I'll keep this uh, to pictures and uh, hopefully that will uh, resonate with everyone. Okay, so there are the challenge um, it, that, that we're, we're facing in, in thinking about correlated quantum matter is that classical approaches need to treat uh, intrinsically the quantum nature of, of our uh, systems here. This is in particular true when we start thinking about highly entangled or uh, various uh, correlated states that have long range interactions. You can also think of cases where there are interactions that intersect with quantum electrodynamics and in fact cases where the, the photon is impacting these types of um, correlations that you can create. It can mediate some of those correlations, it can modify some of those correlations, and those are all aspects that, from a theory standpoint, are challenging. Uh, the, the advent of, of quantum computing has brought new possibilities that perhaps could eliminate the ex exponential complexity that, that I uh, just alluded to, which is ubiquitous in classical simulation of quantum matter. It's something that shows up even if you're using the biggest, baddest exascale uh, system out there. So we've described in, in some detail approaches in um, QED and, and ab initio QED, its intersection with correlated electronic structure methods. I'm gonna tell you about these correlated electronic structure methods in, in some detail here in a second, as well as how you can use techniques from open quantum systems and new types of quantum algorithms to enable new quantum systems. And that includes uh, quantum computers, that includes quantum sensor networks, that, that includes um, other types of, of scalable quantum technologies. And we, we think that this interplay between being able to predict quantum systems better, as well as to create more scalable quantum systems will be a, a nice cycle. So electronic structure methods are, are essentially the, the computational backbone for, for building quantum matter. And so from on the, the left, from atoms to, to bulk material, correlated electronic structure methods are used to investigate properties that include orbital densities, potential energy surfaces, level diagrams, optical transitions, band structure, phase diagrams. And you might recognize some of the techniques on the left as coming from quantum chemistry and techniques on the right coming more from condensed matter theory and materials physics. Now, treating atoms, molecules, materials using computational methods involves solving a many body problem of these various interactions, particularly interacting electrons. And the strongly correlated electron problem has uh, been, been talked about uh, a couple of times already this, this morning, as well as thinking about the nuclei and also coupled electromagnetic fields. 
Now, this is a vast configuration space. And so this problem is, because of that, exponentially complex, and it can only be solved exactly for very small systems. And, and what that very small means is slowly evolving, but it still remains very small relative to, say, the types of, of materials that um, Weiwei just talked about in, in her, her very nice talk. So therefore, all practical methods for real systems have some approximations. And balancing the computational cost of these methods with the accuracy for uh, prediction is really the consistent challenge that shows a shows up across uh, this, this spectrum. So the simplest methods that we can, we can think about to treat the interacting multi-component systems are adiabatic and, and semi-classical approximations, including the, the very famous canonical Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which simplifies the electron nuclei problem. Though, of course, that would mean that it's not treating vibrational strong coupling, say, at the, that same level of theory. Or, and of course, there are semi-classical Schrodinger-Maxwell treatment, which simplifies the problem of including the electromagnetic fields. Now, in each method, the many-body problem is essentially reduced to a you know, something that involves interacting electrons, which are treated as quantized, and a separate problem of nuclei or the field that, that are, are governed by uh, different equations of, of motion. And the different time scales of these are also equally important. So, so we, we spent some time introducing um, the, the various uh, approximations. And, and we split up our, our first part of the, the review, both into wave function based and uh, density based uh, approaches. And I want to highlight here that, that when you're looking at electronic uh, degrees of freedom, um, a, a very common problem is how do you figure out a, a relatively accurate treatment of the electronic uh, correlation? Um, and, and how do you retain that level of um, uh, accuracy to some of these uh, larger uh, systems? So, so they've, there's been a lot of work in this field. And there are several popular methods for approximating the correlation energy. For example, um, Malaplacet probation theory, MPT. By the way, this, this field has a lot of acronyms. So, so <laughs> you'll see that these acronyms show up both in our uh, review as well as in my talk, but I'll, I'll try and explain them uh, as, as much of these pos as, as, as possible. And many of these methods, by the way, have each individually been around and used for decades. And there is an abundance of research that is dedicated to extensions, to improvements and applications and predictions of new uh, phases of, of quantum matter. Okay, so Malaplacet probation theory, MPT, configuration interaction, CI, uh, and, and coupled cluster theory. And, and coupled cluster, of course, has uh, various uh, components to it, single stubbles and, and um, um, you know, various aspects of that. So, so when we're, when we're um, approximating these, and, and that's, that's where this uh, complexity uh, aspect shows up. So N here refers to essentially the, the basis set size. And what I'm showing here is the approximate computational scaling of a variety of electronic structure uh, methods, including HF, which is hartree fock density functional theory, which is in some ways the, the workhorse of what people use uh, quite extensively, um, um, Malaplacid to second order, MP2. Um, there, there are techniques, um, the, the uh, variational 2RDM, uh, the electron reduced density matrix, that's uh, the, the RDM technique. And, and we have an extensive discussion of these uh, RDM methods. Um, the, the couple cluster, singles, doubles, which I've uh, talked about um, a little bit already. And, and it's, it's uh, quite extensively covered in uh, the, the review, as well as how you could think about mapping some of these odd to quantum devices. And uh, the full and, and doubly occupied configuration interactions, so FCI and uh, DOCI, D-O-C-I. Now, this is showing here something very, very simple. This is a dissociation curve for hydrogen fluoride, um, and perhaps a, a very uh, simple calculation, but we are comparing the accuracy of these various methods while keeping in mind the, the computational scaling. And you can imagine when we start to go from, say, something uh, that is more complex than hydrogen fluoride to uh, some of the, the uh, more exciting compounds that have been discussed, uh, this, this um, trade-off between accuracy and scaling will, will continue to, to show up. So a case where this the scaling is um, worth overcoming and does allow us to think about new kinds of um, building blocks for quantum information is when we think about new types of qubits. And Professor Kagan's talk um, 
mentioned uh, some of these already from a, uh, a colloidal quantum dot and, and solid state perspective. So we talk about predictions and approaches for both molecular qubits as well as for uh, solid state uh, spin qubits. And on the left, I'm showing here the crystal structures for a variety of the most relevant spin qubits that are made from uh, transition metals. And, and of course, the, the colors there represent the various types. So you can have iron, copper, chromium, nickel. And, and this is where, by the way, there is a very vast uh, configuration space. And the challenges in predicting these molecular qubits, which you would think are in some ways simpler than artificial atoms trapped in, in solids, is the, the challenges are very similar across the two. And this is both in extending and controlling the coherence time. So thinking about the T1, T2, thinking about the coupling to, to the environment and the degrees of freedom that, that um, would essentially um, change uh, the, the decoherence time and um, how you still need to be able to couple them controllably to each other. So that's uh, frequently something that, that we uh, try and predict. And, and that's, that requires more than um, just a, a direct application of, of one of these uh, existing techniques. So uh, some of the challenges in the field essentially consist of how we can control molecular excited states and entangled processes. There are advantages of using molecular qubits. Uh, particularly because you have a choice in the molecular structure, the ligands that are attached, the bonding that you can access. And this is, uh, there's, a, there's a whole area of, of people now getting into uh, molecular qubits where you could use different chemical types and, and uh, tune the properties. That's in some ways easier than finding a new color center in diamond or silicon carbide or your favorite 2D material. Uh, of course, it has uh, some, some of uh, those same challenges. And um, a majority of the progress in this field has been driven by experiments, but there is a lot of potential for theoretically and, and computationally guided search for ideal molecular qubits. Uh, we highlight one example of CASP2 that was used to predict the uh, pulse electron paramagnetic resonance spectrum of the spin density uh, on, on the metal centers in molecular qubit candidates. Uh, since the time that the review appeared, the short amount of time, there have already been a, a few other papers that have shown up in the archive that treat the, um, the, the behavior of these molecular qubits. So, uh, I, I encourage you to, to look at some of them. On the right, I'm showing a, a problem that is um, a little more well established in the field, which is how do we think about these defects in, in solids that could act as optically addressable spin qubits. A good example of this is the NB center in, in diamond, but in addition to the NB center, there are group four quantum defects that have been recently reported, pioneering work, including by uh, Natalie DeLeon in, in thinking about neutrally charged um, uh, color centers, the silicon vacancy neutral in, in diamond, but there are, there's a whole host of these. And something that we highlight is that the correlated nature of the electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom that show up in some of these cases, particularly the, the Jan Teller effect in these systems is incredibly uh, challenging for, for uh, conventional theoretical uh, techniques. And, and there are cases where we need to treat simultaneously the um, the, the coupled electron nuclear degrees of freedom for, for the Anteller, as well as this um, spin physics and the intersystem crossing. So we talked about the techniques that are available to us today, as well as where uh, techniques uh, in, in this field uh, could go in future. So I want to emphasize that, yes, there is a, a, a deep literature of defects in solids and how you predict those. And some of those are applicable here in, in some forms, but need to be extended uh, a fair bit in order to, to address uh, predictions for, for the level structures, the splittings, as well as uh, what, is, um, what is seen in, in the, the spin physics of these uh, color centers. Okay, so with everything that we talk about here and correlations, I, I um, alluded to the impact of the photon. And that can happen in two regimes. One is where you have strong coupling to the cavity. And this is where you're in the few photon regime and it's, it's, it's coupling to the, um, the, the correlations that matter. Those could be electronic correlations. Those could be the, um, the phonons. The other is where you're driving the, the um, various states of, of quantum matter. And I want to highlight here that there are pioneering experiments that have happened in the, the last uh, five to 10 years, in part enabled by the new um, 
sources that, that have allowed us to, to span this entire spectrum, essentially in very controllable, ultra-fast drive. And yet theory has a fair bit of catch up to do here uh, with, with thinking about how conventional statistical and computational techniques in thermodynamic equilibrium, um, which, which cannot be straightforwardly extended or generalized to systems that are driven far from equilibrium. And we talk about this in our, our paper because driving types of, of quantum matter is, is in fact a way of creating new, new states, new phases. And um, this is an area where I'd say time dependent density function theory would not, with, with all its merits and challenges, would still not be a faithful description of non-trivial correlation effects. So thinking about non-equilibrium Green's functions and other diagrammatic techniques, which provide a framework for getting few body correlation effects is, is uh, good without actually computing the actual many body wave function, which as I have mentioned a few times now, would be incredibly um, uh, complex and computationally a, a, a heavy lift. And so we talk about this and we uh, show some of the, the experiments, including those in uh, um, uh, STO that have uh, recently energized the fields with, with tunable wavelength pulses, uh, various types of dynamical ferroelectricity that has been seen in this phase diagram, as well as um, you know, uh, linking with, with the uh, previous talk, how you could use the drive to, uh, in, in some ways, create and stabilize uh, transient uh, superconductors. This is an area that is um, taking off and is uh, an area where there are many open questions around the mechanism. Uh, there, there are uh, spirited debates in the, the literature, which hopefully we've captured in a, uh, a fair manner and also um, try to, to show the path for um, future work. So in the last couple of minutes, let me switch gears to um, the, the other half of how we think about quantum information and algorithms for, for correlated quantum matter, which is in uh, thinking about hybrid quantum classical algorithms. So currently, most of the quantum algorithms that are relevant to physics and chemistry are hybrid algorithms, right? And what I mean by hybrid is part of the computation is performed in a classical device. It could be a laptop, it could be a local cluster, it could be an exascale system. And typically, that's the per parameter optimization step. And, and the remaining part is done on a quantum device. And I, I really call it a quantum device here because it could be a, a superconducting quantum device that is um, you know 53 54 qubits uh, we've seen and, and talked about in, in the review some of the uh, advances from Google IBM and other um, uh, titans in, in industry on this but still you're only doing a part of the problem on the quantum device both parts of the calculation can interact they can be iterated and and there are various schemes for doing that so the most Commonly used one is the variational quantum eigensolver, where you variationally. Uh, 15 minutes. Okay, got it. Um, so I, I, I hope you'll uh, look at this part of the review. There are uh, various flavors of VQE, uh, there are limitations and, and um, approaches that, that uh, build on VQE and other types of algorithms that have nothing to do with VQE that, that we hope will be uh, used in, in predicting uh, types of, of uh, uh, quantum matter. And in maybe the last two seconds, I want to uh, point out that, that we um, have thought about open quantum systems. This is the work of, of today that we um, I, I'm showing here on, on the slide with discussions of what environmental noise does to, to uh, a set of qubits and how you could describe that from a theory standpoint and how you could map certain problems that are inherently non-Markovian onto actual quantum devices. There's a class of algorithms that allow you to do that. And um, I, I hope you will uh, take a look at some of this work. So, so with that, um, I hope that our presentation of, of various uh, directions and quantum information and algorithms for, for quantum matter uh, resonates with, with the community. And we, we look forward to um, many advances in many body quantum states, descriptions of large scale entangled states, and uh, perhaps even using some of these algorithms for a uh, better understanding of high TC superconductivity. So um, I'll open it up for questions. Thanks so much, Cree. Uh, so there are two questions in the Q&A right now. Uh, one is from Shane Lawrence in uh, Cambridge, who asks, could the optimization of coupling theory equations help towards refining quantum methods? 
Um, so I, I interpret your question to mean, are there various um, optimal controls that we can come up with to, to um, improve the, the coherence time and optimize noise on near-term quantum devices? And the answer to that is yes. Um, in fact, um, since I didn't get a chance to show the slide, but now I do, we talk about two different examples. One is uh, a set of, of uh, where, where you're essentially looking at the longitudinal relaxation process of the ND center in terms of the probability of the, the initial uh, state of the, the electron spin. I think there are ways that you could come up with control sequences, control protocols that allow you to get um, and, and improve the, the coherence time. So there are um, equations that, that uh, also link with, um, and we, we don't talk about this so much in the review, but um, there, there's a whole field of, of control theory and how you could uh, adapt approaches from optimal control to think about quantum devices. Uh, the bottom here, I'm showing to you how this can be done on a qubit, uh, not a qubit, but a qubit, and, and uh, how you could use uh, various optimized amplitudes with control to uh, improve the coherence times. So hopefully I interpreted your question correctly. If not, please write me an email and I can, I can address it then. Um, and the other question I'm not sure is in the scope of your talk, unless there's some terminology that I totally don't understand, which is entirely possible, uh, but it's which computational method is more accurate to study nuclear quantum effects? Um, maybe if I could turn that question around and say, you know, are we capturing effects that involve uh, strong coupling to um, uh, vibrational modes and, and how are nuclei included? Yes, we have done some, some work in, in including nuclei explicitly in um, our calculations and, and looked at the, the various uh, observables that uh, go, go from that. Um, I think that there's a lot more to be done if you want to actually claim that we've gone past the conventional board Oppenheimer picture. So there's a long road towards that. Okay, well, if there are other questions for Pri, I think people can put them in the chat. Thanks, Pri. Okay, wonderful. So now we are, are um, going back to um, Bob Kava, who, um, as I said, we, we switched the order a bit, and he will now tell us about hexagonal perovskites at, as quantum materials. Or what, what happened at the end of the share screen? Uh, where is it? Well, anyway, it disappeared. So every, so it's always comical when Kava is involved because there can be mysterious things that happen to me. But yeah, I don't know where the screen sharing went, but it disappeared. Okay, but anyway, so our review is a, yeah, I don't wonder what happened. Yeah, you can share the slides. Can you, can you make those show up, Prinha? Yeah. God knows. Anyway, good luck. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? Anyway, so I'm here and you can kind of hear me and I guess you're just not going to get a talk. You're just going to go home or whatever. But so uh, ours is about hexagonal perovskites. It's a classical solid state chemistry review. And I know that, um, you know, perovskites are very popular in the world nowadays. And um, they have been extremely popular at the border between um, between materials chemistry and materials physics for some time. And I always think it's because oxygen is a remarkable element in the periodic table. And so sometimes you get, um, I don't know where that went, where, where it went, just forgot it. Okay. Because oxygen is such a remarkable element in the periodic table that it just, does, it does good things. Okay. Do I dare to do this? No, I don't. Where it if you all want go. to send your slides, if you want to email your slides to somebody, then they could maybe show them. For yeah. Why didn't it show? Who knows? Yeah. Okay. Whatever. You can send your slides to me. Yeah. Here's some slides. I wonder if this will should now work if I can get down to the stupid thing. Where is it? Um, if it's helpful, I can also yes. pull up your review. And if Don't, you want panic. To... Don't panic. Don't panic. Here we go. This should work, right? Do you see my slide? Yes, it's starting to work. I think we're in good shape. Yes, okay. we see that. Anyway, so I, I promise to not, sorry for the delay. It's the usual comedy with me. But anyway, so my student Lori and I wrote a thing about hexagonal perovskites, and they're very, very 
important, well, they're un, unkilled yet in, in oxide materials, but I think they work for a chemical reason. So basically, um, oxide perovskites work, I mean, hexagonal perovskites work because um, hexagonal closest pack layers are very stable. And you learned when you were children that hexagonal closest packing is good. And so suppose you could have a positive ion that was a good fit in a negative ion closed pack layer. And I think that that is a remarkable thing and that in the periodic table where there are lots of remarkable things, um, this happens to happen with uh, barium and oxygen. And if you have a different kind of non-metal making a closed pack layer, it might be something else. So here's here's a review. And and Laurie and I wrote this thing. Laurie is my graduate student. He's a fantastic kid. And basically, you know, perovskites have now made it into noticed by the general chemistry community. And I think that, as I mentioned before, oxygen is really remarkable because of the way the orbitals in oxygen hybridize with many elements in the periodic table. And what's fascinating to me about hexagonal perovskites is how they are a mixture between these closest packed metal oxygen layers, which I don't know if you can see, and, and with barium in them. And then um, the, the regular perovskite lattice, which is just corner sharing octahedra. So we can go from face sharing octahedra to corner sharing octahedra in a, an entire family of compounds that just change the ratio of, of face sharing to corner sharing octahedra. And so um, dramatically change the magnetic coupling and the, and the electronic coupling in the system. So we've got slide number two. Slide number three is something that I think has never been confirmed, but it's kind of crazy. So the first thing I want to say is hexagonal perovskites are a remarkable series of compounds because of the different number of variations you can have. And the variation type one is changing the ratio of purely hexagonal layers, which give you face sharing octahedra and, and um, like things that are more like cubic layers. So yeah, barium strontium ruthenate is a perfect example of that. And barium ruthenate itself is got multiple choices for kinds of structures that it makes. So it's pretty cool. And then if we want to start looking at different variations of hexagonal perovskites, which is what our review is about, you can look at barium manganate, which is just got a chain, BAMNO3. You could take some oxygen out and start disrupting the chains. And, and you can change it to just trimers, a tetramers plus a, both dimers and dimers and only dimers by changing the oxygen content. So, you know, it's not so simple. The, the, uh, the fun here is that manganese can have different oxidation states in these substances. You'll notice that as you, if you are a formal electron counting kind of person, you'll realize that the manganese oxidation state here is changing. And the, the, um, there's no actual localization of the oxygen vacancies in these things. Okay, to go on, sorry to be a character, but there it is. And so um, let's say we had a sim the simplest hexagonal perovskites just have chains going in one direction that are arranged in a triangular lattice. So that's the simplest hexagonal perovskite. But the chains don't need to have only one kind of atom in the chain. So um, in the review, we talk a lot about, or we talk about taking hexagonal perovskites and making, taking the basic thing, which is a chain of atoms that are in a face sharing geometry, and then changing when they have um, some corner sharing allowed and when they actually have other atoms that are allowed to be in the chain. And things like strontium platinate and calcium platinate are just classical examples <coughs> of things where you have other kinds of atoms in the chain. And if you have other kinds of atoms, you basically, you can break up this chain and break up the coupling between the metal oxygen octahedra in the chain. Now, I think these are a testimony to 
how wonderful solid state chemistry is as a field because you know who could predict such a crazy thing that in the case of strontium 4 pto6 it's a mixture of strontium that's in a cavity like an a site cavity and strontium that's in a chain it's a pretty hard thing to imagine that this happens and then in some cases as well which i don't even know if my pointer is showing up but basically you know the chains can be incommensurate so this chain a chain in the middle of the cell doesn't have to be lined up with the chain on the corners of the cell so they can be um, particularly odd and entertaining and uh, here's one that i really like but i guess it requires more work which is barium 6 nickel 5015 it's shown on the left side of this slide this material has a mixture of nickel 2 and nickel 4 in it formally and the nickel 2 is being a big atom is in a triangular prism and the nickel 4 being a small atom is supposedly in a set of octahedra that share faces with each other but how can that be how can you have a nickel 2 and a nickel 4 and skip nickel 3 i just don't get it anyway but that's entertaining okay so this is the solid state chemistry review that's in the in the thing and basically we'll get to the end here and at some point and talk about what people have actually measured but you know once you start putting atoms in crystal structures they do what they do and i have an opinion about atoms having personalities and they just do whatever it is they intend to do with their lives and they didn't care what i really wanted to do with them but so here's an example of two crystal structures that are nominally identical uh S, it's ba2 sc scandium aluminum o5 and this thing can either make a hexagonal perovskite that has uh, dimers of face sharing octahedra or dimers of corner sharing tetrahedra they are polymorphs of each other they have the same number of layers per cell but they're polymorphic so this is a, a sweet thing because aluminum oxidized aluminum oxides are bizarre i mean aluminum is a lovely element in the periodic table because it doesn't know whether it wants to be in an octahedron or in a tetrahedron and so yeah, here's an example where it just doesn't know what to do so it makes different polymorphs that have different coronation polyhedra from aluminum so i have kind of a generic chemical view here now you can take um hexagonal perovskites the trick for physical properties of these quantum materials is to break up the chains. So um, you probably don't know it, but you know, uh, one dimensional chains of, of magnetic atoms can have particular um, electronic structures that can be calculated and understood. But when you start breaking up the chains, well, so that's interesting in itself. But you can also use solid state chemistry to start breaking the chains up. And here's an example of a barium ruthenium platinum oxychloride where the ruthenium and platinum form an ordered trimer. But the trimer is basically a chain that's broken up by the fact that you have barium chloride layers in there. So once you have, you can, you can have a barium chloride layer, but that thing being so big, the chlorine being so big, means that it doesn't mix with oxygen and it forms in a distinct layer. Okay. To tell you how remarkable hexagonal perovskites are, here's just kind of a generic picture of how you can do it. I mean, all these things are known substances. So here's a typical chain substance that has dimers of face sharing octahedra and then, and then the trigonal prisms, which you saw. And then I can make a seven layer substance, a six layer substance, a four layer substance, a two layer substance. They can have hexagonal symmetry or they can have rhombohedral symmetry. So I, I find the variety here to be remarkable. And these are really relatively obscure compounds. So anything can happen here, right? And it's all a matter of what do the elements want to do? Um, this, there are many variations to talk about, and I'll try to behave. Natalie, you can make sure I don't talk too long, which is always a problem for me. But, you know, 
hexagonal perovskites, calling them hexagonal is kind of a, a generic term, but if you work on hexagonal substances, you know that they can actually have small structural distortions. And the good thing about oxides in particular to me is that they, that their crystal structures are really, really very, very sensitive to, to small variations in electron configuration or orbitals and things like that. So here's an example of how a hexagonal perovskite, which is just got hexagonal layers of, of octahedra, can actually become monoclinic when there's a small stacking problem with, between the layers. So if the layers don't stack exactly on top of each other, it's not hexagonal anymore. And that's how you get a symmetry change in a hexagonal perovskite. Okay, I think I can skip this thing about um, polymorphs, but basically the story is, you know, just because you have a formula that looks to you like a simple, um, let's say a simple perovskite, like barium, to scanium aluminum O5 doesn't mean that that's what you're going to get. It mean you could get something odd, where in fact you have disorder and you have a bizarre hexagonal perovskite. Okay, keep going. All right, now we're going to get on to some physical properties. This is, these are also in the review. So basically, you know, hexagonal perovskites give you the opportunity to study what happens in transition metal compounds when you have different kinds of sharing of polyhedra present. And the dimer ones have been studied a lot by materials physicists. So um, hexagonal perovskites that are dimers, that have metal oxygen dimers, are well studied. And we're going to look at um, isolating these dimers. And sometimes they're isolated and sometimes they're not isolated. So this is BA3TIRU209. And nominally, you would guess that the titanium is separated from the ruthenium so that the ruthenium make these dimers and the titanium is separate. But that doesn't happen. What actually happens is that titanium and ruthenium are so similar that they have disordered structure. And so you get what's called a spin glass, which in some people's worlds is interesting and in my world is not interesting because Basically, these, ruthenium is a 4D element that has unpaired D electrons. Ruthenium 4 plus is an interesting 4D element because it has unpaired electrons. So it might do something quantum mechanical. We'll see that in a minute. But in this case, it didn't do anything interesting because there's disorder. But some people like that. Um, in particular, the, the world the world of materials physics right now is interested in something called quantum spin liquids. And quantum spin liquids are materials that have magnetic moments that can be cooled to very, very low temperature in which can, and the magnetic moments never magnetically order in a classical sense. You have fluctuations between different states of the magnetic system, but they are, are dominated by quantum fluctuations, not by by classical coupling. So um, people have, are studying iridium oxide examples of hexagonal perovskites now because hexagonal symmetry can result in the frustration of long range magnetic ordering. What that means is if I put a basically a 5D element on a magnetic lattice that is based on triangles, something odd may happen. You may be able to cool it to really, really low temperature, and it may never magnetically order because it's having quantum fluctuations between different allowed states at low temperature. That's called a quantum spin liquid. It's a very hot topic in material science nowadays, in materials physics. And um, this just is a slide that shows some of the many studies that have been done on dimers which are interesting. Now, we're in the last part of the talk, we'll talk about a progression as we go down a column in the periodic table. So we're going to start with 3D elements. Um, we're going to go start with 3D, go to 4D, and then go to 5D. And you learned when you were children that um, 
3D elements have localized electrons in orbitals that are bonded to their ligands, and we can think of them by simple electron counting. And that 5D elements, now the orbitals get more extended so that it's not so obvious what's going to happen anymore because, um, you know, as the orbitals get more and more extended, you get stronger and stronger overlap between the metal and the ligand, and then you may not be able to do any simple electron counting to understand what happened. I like trimers in my in my hexagonal perovskites because this thing that's like a trimer shown here in purple is like a little molecule in a magnet. So I basically I've lined uh, sorry a little molecule in an extended solid in a solid that is perfectly uh, crystalline in three dimensions, but has this magnetic trimer in it. So where is the spin? Is the question. And in 3D elements, you expect to be able to count the electrons properly, and that's exactly what happens. So if this thing is a mixture of manganese 4 plus and manganese 3 plus, uh, formally, you can write Ba4, Nb, and Mn3, O12 as a mixture of manganese 4 plus and manganese 3 plus. Even though you can't isolate them as such, you can you can say, well, I can understand the magnetism by, by just having a localized spin picture for the manganese 4 and manganese 3. However... Hey, Bob, that's uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. However, this breaks down right away when we get to uh, ruthenium, which is a 4D element, and this is barium-4 niobium ru 3012 Now, this, the spin seems to be delocalized on the trimer. So already... On a, by the time we get to a 4D element, things are looking funny already. And then, so blah, 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 4D element. And here's some electronic structure calculations to show the orbitals that the electrons are in. And now we're going to just, to finish up, we'll look at these um, two elements that are the same column at the periodic table. And I'm always kind of stunned about by regular inorganic chemistry where, like, D6 elements are just so stable, or D6 electron configurations are so stable that you don't see magnetism. And niobium is one example of that. And uh, rhodium 3 plus compound here should be boring because it's got D6 elements in it, but in fact, it's magnetic. So barium, niobium, rhodium oxide is magnetic. And here's how we, how physicists would interpret magnetic properties. Basically, it's a low magnetic moment, but it's there. And the iridium, so rhodium and iridium are in the same color of the periodic table. They make these hexagonal perovskites. And let's look at the iridium case. This thing has a very low magnetic moment. How can you possibly imagine that an iridium compound can have a very, very low magnetic moment? It's just very hard to imagine. And we're going to end here with this thing right here, which is that um, you, can take, you can take these materials to extremely low temperature where quantum mechanics is really going to matter. And you can look at the heat capacity of barium-4, niob barium niobium, iridium-3012, and barium-4, niobium, rhodium-3012. And you'll notice that the heat capacity, which is something you learned when you were children, should go to zero at zero Kelvin, doesn't go to zero at zero Kelvin in barium-4, niobium, iridium-3012. In other words, there are quantum fluctuations between the possible uh, arrangements of the moments in barium, niobium, meridium oxide. So this, this is just an example of a quantum state of matter at low temperature in a hexagonal perovskite. So hexagonal perovskites are a divine area. Good news is, to end my little talk here, is that hexagonal perovskites have not yet been worked to oblivion, which is my saying. I mean, I hate working on things where everybody knows exactly what's going to happen already. And unfortunately, some things are so, so much, so done so much that who cares what they do anymore? And so there they are. But thankfully, these are not in oblivion anymore. And so there's lots of things that are left to do. And I think uh, they have not been exploited broadly in any world yet. <laughs>